Thank you, Yvonne. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I have to compliment Jamie Montgomery for providing the classiest podium I have ever <laughs> been privileged to stand behind, so thank you for that. So I feel like Debbie Downer to this nice party where we've all talked about beneficial organisms and exciting developments in cheese. And um, now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about listeria and some very serious regulatory implications for artisan cheesemakers. But also the good news story, what we can all do to be very proactive in dealing with this organism. And so what I'd like to do is just review very briefly um, listeria and monocytogeny specifically and some of the public health concern to, concerns and why we're interested in this pathogen. I'll go over some of the current research in my laboratory and then I'll spend a bit of time on US regulatory activity and the implications of the Food Safety Modernization Act for artisan cheesemakers. Um, here's a friend. We're lucky to have the Vermont Institute for Artisan Cheese that um, really is focused on the needs of the artisan industry, small scale cheesemakers. And for a long time, I've been concerned about the impact of regulatory regulations that are written for large scale food processors and what happens to small scale food processors and how we can make sure we don't lose that community um, from our food producers. And so our institute um, serves to inform national and international scientific policy discussions surrounding things like cheese safety, global trade, regulations. And we also identify um, research needs, particularly that focused on issues and challenges faced by small scale cheese producers. We're lucky to have um, a lot of active grants in the lab, and one that's um, currently funded by the USDA is allowing us to take a look at the exciting developments in the US, specifically um, artisan cheese industry. And if you look at the top 10 states with the greatest number of artisan producers, and this information is hot off the press, you can see New York leads our country with 72 artisan producers. The state of Maine, which wasn't on the radar a few years back, has 61 artisan producers. Pennsylvania with 58, California with 54, Wisconsin, and we go down the list. But you look at this explosive growth and with ne nearly 75% of cheese businesses identified as farmstead, important questions remain regarding product quality and consistency, as well as food safety, sanitation, and hygiene. And so promoting food safety will be the key to sustaining growth of the artisan industry, not just in the United States, but around the globe. Now, when we look at managing risks, the pathogens of concern to cheesemakers, um, Salmonella, specifically Salmonella typhimurium, DT104, and Salmonella Newport, multi-drug resistant strains of Salmonella, Listeria monocytogenes, E. coli 0157H7, and Staphylococcus aureus. We have to manage risks from these pathogens to prevent um, outbreaks of illness. And in order to put together the tools, again, to harmonize the work that Marie Christine is doing, um, development of microbiological criteria for raw milk destined for aged raw milk cheese making is probably a tool to help us control some of these risks. So Listeria monocytogenes, why are we concerned? This organism is a leading cause of death from a foodborne pathogen in the United States. And if that statistic were not true, we wouldn't be worried about this pathogen. The current incidents, there are about 250 deaths each year in the US. It's a very rare cause of foodborne illness, but because of the high mortality, we're very concerned about this pathogen. The good news is, 
there has been a precipitous decline in cases of listeriosis. Most um, microbiologists, uh, people that study salmonella, despite everything we know about salmonella, we have many more cases today than we did 40 years ago. The opposite is true with listeria. And as we learn more, we can do more interventions and decrease the number of cases. So I think when I started in this business, there were probably 750 deaths a year in the United States. And to have that kind of impact on public health is not insignificant. Now, again, um, the Centers for Disease Control, their latest data released last year, when you look at the top five pathogens causing domestically acquired foodborne illnesses resulting in death, listeria is number three on that list. And the time that it remains there, um, our regulatory agencies will be concerned about it. Now, part of the whole um, risk continuum involves the consumers at risk, and I think that's a piece that we're not paying enough attention to. When we look at who is vulnerable to infection by listeria, the elderly, pregnant women, persons whose immune system is suppressed for some reason, either they've received organ transplants, they're being treated for various cancers, they have autoimmune um, or chronic inflammatory disease or HIV AIDS. What's happening, again, we have an aging population, not only in the United States, but here in the UK as well. That proportion of high-risk consumers continues to grow. And so where 20 years ago, high-risk consumers may have represented 15% of the US population, now we're talking about 30% of consumers. And so the persons who are susceptible continue to increase. Now, what we've been doing in our laboratory, the way that our government and other governments around the world regulate foods, most of us are dealing with risk assessments. And, and that's the, the body of science that we use to inform how we're going to approach controlling risk. The only information that ends up in risk assessments are um, papers that are published in refereed journals. And so that's why conferences of this nature are critically important and getting published information into scientific journals. That's the only information that's going to be considered in risk assessments. When we look at what's been published specifically dealing with artisan cheese, there isn't a lot that's been published and we need to greatly expand that. So we just set out to do as much as we could on our end of things to help inform um, some of these questions. One being, what is the incidence of pathogens in raw milk that's specifically destined for cheese making, not for fluid um, production, not for raw uh, fluid consumption, but specifically for artisan cheese making? And what we find is that when we look at um, raw milk from 11 different farmstead cheese operations, Staph aureus was the principal pathogen of concern being de detected in 46 of 133 milk samples that we analyzed. Listeria, you very rarely find this pathogen in milk, only three of 133 samples. E. coli 0157H7, we only ever saw in one milk sample, and we've never found any salmonella in raw milk that we've analyzed specifically for artisan cheese making. Um, we repeated this survey in 2008. Staph aureus was the only pathogen recovered from milk samples. We saw no listeria, E. coli 0157H7, or salmonella. And so we can conclude that most raw milk intended for artisan cheese making is of, of high microbiological quality, and there is a very low incidence of pathogens. Now we also look, we, um, we, we do have a good relationship with the Food and Drug Administration, and especially, especially the scientists working in the agency, the Food and Drug Administration being the group that regulates um, cheesemakers in the United States. And um, we, we try and help guide FDA in areas where they should focus more instead of less attention um, or all of their attention and leave things that aren't problems alone. And that's sometimes hard to do. And so we pointed out that 
In our current Code of Federal Regulations, there's a section, CFR 133-182, that um, gives, provides guidance to cheesemakers. And in our country, the 60-day aging rule applies, can be applied to um, making a soft or semi-soft cheese. And we pointed out to FDA that the longer that you age a soft ripened cheese, if it's contaminated with listeria, you're gonna start from very low levels of the organism and end up with probably a million organisms at the end of 60 days of aging, which really poses a public health risk. And so probably that section of the CFR should be rewritten because 60 days of aging is not a tool to achieve safety. Um, and we actually published this paper, again, trying to provide some oomph that instead of banning all raw milk cheese making, why not focus on those sections of the Code of Federal Regulations that are most problematic? If you look at the fate of listeria in an aged cheddar cheese, for instance, the pathogen doesn't like the cheddar environment, declines over time, and so the longer you age a cheddar cheese, you see declines in listeria populations, and those foods that are at greatest risk are those that support high-level growth of this pathogen. You contrast behavior in a cheddar cheese to what happens in a soft ripened cheese, and you can see at 60 days you have very high populations of listeria that would prevent a public health risk. And so again, pointing out some of these um, obvious things is, is what you have to do in refereed publications. We were also fortunate to receive some money from USDA to look at what we could do um, to develop risk reduction programs specifically for listeria. And over the last few years, we've worked with 16 Vermont um, farmstead cheesemakers trying to do this comprehensive risk reduction program. As we found with our raw milk surveillance, Staph aureus is the most common pathogen isolated from raw milk when we do this new survey. When we um, go and look at the cheese-making environment, we do see Listeria monocytogenes. Um, we can isolate it from environmental sites, including floors, drains, milk cans, and crates. And so our question was, what um, series of interventions could we um, impart to make this pathogen go away? And here's the list. You see floor drains, we all know as a, a main source of listeria. 34% um, of the total sites were drains in production that were positive for this pathogen, drains in aging rooms. Floors, another place where you, during surveillance, find listeria. Um, squeegees, pooled water, water hoses, cheese knives, um, and down it goes. The really great news about this um, risk reduction program, FDA wasn't actively doing surveillance of cheesemaking establishments when we started this program, but they um, initiated active surveillance after we'd completed round one of this program. Mateo's smiling, and so I get asked by regulators in, in many of the states around the United States, how are you helping the Vermont cheesemakers? Well, we're getting there before the FDA does. And so I'll walk you through a little bit of what happens when we do um, some of these risk reduction audits. But I will say, you can see in this graph, these are um, ribotypes of listeria. We do a little bit of um, genetic analysis. And that dupe 1042, that strain of listeria is particularly persistent in cheesemaking environments. It's the same strain of listeria that caused a major outbreak of listeriosis in New England back in 1983. It killed 14 people in Boston, Massachusetts. And that strain is still persistent almost 30 years later in our environment. And so when listeria gets established, it's very difficult to get rid of, but it can be done. And so what we found from this um, USDA study was that corrective action, alteration of traffic flow patterns, operating procedures to eliminate cross-contamination was effective as the pathogen was eliminated from contaminated sites. 
And results from our 2009 risk reduction program revealed that good manufacturing practices are lacking in many small-scale cheesemaking operations. When we see listeria being present, it's not the result of anything that can't be controlled. Many times people get complacent, they're not engaged in procedures that when FDA is out there actively doing surveillance, you need your A game and you need to be playing up here. And so any kind of audit that goes on is just a good reminder that go back to the basics and embrace those good manufacturing practices. We're continuing to do um, risk reduction this year. And I'll, I'll, again, I'll walk you through some of the details of this because I think it's a good thing that um, many other places could be embracing. We send in a team and spend a total of two days with each cheesemaker. On the first day, we do a comprehensive review of the cheesemaking process from milking to aging. This intake process allows a comprehensive flow sheet of the cheesemaking process in its entirety to be developed. And then using HACCP, we identify critical control points in the process. The type of cheese being manufactured, an assessment of risk, whether it's a high risk versus low risk product, dependent on the cheese characteristics. And then physical notes from the structural facility, the condition of the facility, the layout, traffic flow are all compiled. And then cheese making is conducted by the cheesemaker um, with participation from um, one of our staff people. A system for process control is put in place through identification of key parameters needing routine measurement during cheese making. Things like pH, titratable acidity, salt and moisture, percent moisture, and this being based on the federal standard of identity for the type of cheese being manufactured. We then collect microbiological samples. Um, milk, curds, whey, and finished cheese are analyzed for things like standard plate count, coliforms, somatic cell count, and then for target pathogens consisting of Listeria monocytogenes, Salmonella, E. coli 0157H7, and Staph aureus. We also collect environmental swab and sponge samples from target areas in the cheese manufacturing facility. Again, floor drains, floors, vats, tables, cart squeegees, floor mops. And then data from the microbiological analysis is shared with the cheese maker and recommendations made for focus on critical areas of the process. It's one thing to do and a walkthrough audit in the abstract. It's totally different when you come back with data for the cheesemaker in their own environment. And we don't need to do any more than show the data and, and things are done and it's a great educational tool. We do though, we recommend changes as necessary, uh, changes in the make process. Many times people's salt and moisture is way, way off in a cheese. Well, how long has it been like this? I don't know, six months, a year, it's like, well, <laughs> maybe we need to work on, you know, when did you start seeing blowing? When did you start seeing this coliform problem, right? When that salt and moisture changed. Little tools like that. Um, so we recommend changes in the make process, the physical layout of the facility, reorientation of foot traffic, changes in sanitation, the need for protective clothing such as gowns, hairnets, gloves, hand washing and sanitation, implementation of hygienic zoning, improvements of milk quality. And then we leave it to the cheesemaker to determine if and how the recommendations can be implemented. And most of the time everything is implemented. We then go back after there's been implementation and um, do the same type of microbiological analysis and um, determine if what we've recommended has made a difference. The reason we're doing this project this year is the safety plans that have been developed can serve as the basis of a written food safety plan to begin to meet the requirements of the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act. Which, um, how many of you have heard about the Food Safety Modernization Act? If you haven't heard about it, you're going to hear a lot more as it um, becomes implemented. This was signed into law by President Obama in January of 2011. 
It focuses the Food and Drug Administration on prevention of foodborne illness instead of reacting to outbreaks. They are trying to be proactive. This act gives FDA brand new enforcement authorities to achieve higher rates of compliance with prevention and risk-based um, food safety standards and to better respond to problems. What I think is going to be really interesting, and, and I'll even dare say a bit problematic, is FDA has new tools to hold imported foods to the same standards as domestic foods. And this directs FDA to build an integrated national food safety system in partnership with state and local authorities, mainly because there isn't any money to fund this program. And so, but FDA is marching on in spite of that. Now, amongst other things, um, this new law requires um, establishment of records. And so the Section 306 of the Bioterrorism Act amended um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act by adding a section which provided FDA with the authority to access records if FDA has a reasonable belief of adulteration or presents a threat of serious adverse health consequences or death to humans and animals. Before this act, they lacked that authority. They added a new section um, that FDA may establish requirements for establishment and maintenance of records by persons, excluding farms and restaurants, who manufacture, process, pack, transport, distribute, receive, hold, or import food. And so that's most of us in this room. The import requirements are closely tied to preventive controls and produce safety requirements. And this, these really call for a fundamental paradigm shift. Instead of an FDA inspector who detects and corrects problems at the port of entry, which is the old model, the Food Safety Modernization Act makes importers accountable for verifying that food has been produced in accordance with U.S. standards or under modern preventive controls that provide the same level of public health protection. So importers must manage the supply chains to ensure the safety of imported foods. And what is happening now is FDA has established international offices in, I believe, nine different areas of the world. And they're starting to do audits. Um, this is a copy of a warning letter that came out of an audit in France. And I'll just read a little bit of it. Your firm does not use plant equipment materials, namely the foam rubber type material used with the pressure plates that allow for adequate cleaning to comply with um, 21 CFR. And so under a Food Safety Modernization Act, the FDA is going to be looking at practices and determining whether these um, comply with US regulations. And so it really is going to be interesting with respect to artisan cheese practices where things like use of wooden cheese making, use of wood shelves, um, use of other practices that aren't our norm um, may be challenged under all of this regulation. And so all of us are going to need to be vigilant in communication, but there's also an incredible opportunity to educate the FDA inspectors who know so little about artisan cheese. And Marie, some of your data is going to be really useful in this. And I think I, I, I can just envision these French FDA wars. And I actually would love to be in the room when some of these discussions are taking place. Ah, so what is FDA up to um, right now in the United States? They have targeted the artisan cheese industry. Um, they, con between 2010 and 2011, FDA conducted environmental surveillance of U.S. cheesemakers, specifically producing soft cheese. 154 plants um, in total, and included in that were 41 artisan producers. 31% of the plants to tested to date had positive environmental findings for Listeria monocytogenes. The industrial plants had a slightly higher incidence, but again, that number is um, a lot higher than FDA would like to see. And so in FY 2013, which begins October 1, um, 
FDA is going to target 264 facilities for inspection. And um, it's, it, they're out there now. We get calls all the time. Our cheese making community is pretty close knit and no pun intended. And um, we, you know, the phone starts ringing when they're out there. But I, I don't know how many plants were visited in Vermont just in the last couple of weeks, three or, wow. It, so it, it's, it's basically put the industry under a microscope. And what these inspections consist of, FDA will show up with um, three inspectors, all dressed in you know, bunny suits, and they'll spend up to three days in a facility t collecting swabs. Mateo, you've been through this. Um, it's, it's a little nerve-wracking for um, cheesemakers. And in addition to the swabbing, they're gonna be looking at compliance of artisan facilities and practices with Title 21 of the US Code of Federal Regulations, specifically targeting current good manufacturing practices. And so it remains to be seen um, what these results reveal. When, when um, Rachel was giving her presentation, both Rachel and Ben, an important thing that you see is the absence of pathogens when you actually look at finished product, right? So what's disturbing about the current FDA swabbing activity, they're taking action on facilities just based on the environmental presence of listeria. And does the environmental presence translate into a public health threat? And we don't know what the answer to that is. What we do know is FDA has had an ongoing um, domestic and imported cheese compliance program. And just a month ago, I asked the head of the FDA dairy division that question, is there any correlation with um, results from the finished product testing and the environmental analysis? And the answer was, well, we haven't looked at that data. And they almost never look at this data. And so luckily, I have a lot of friends who are lawyers. And under the Freedom of Information Act, this is publicly available information. And so we analyzed some of it for FDA. Um, <laughs> so with respect to listeria, in the years, um, fiscal year 04, 05, and 06, that's the only years they'd give us data for. But when you look at the cheeses that are causing, that, that have um, yielded the majority of positive samples for listeria, they're Hispanic style soft cheeses for the most part, um, many times made under conditions that um, are problematic. And so you look in FY04, um, 11 Mexican style soft cheese samples were positive. But what's interesting, as the years of um, this analysis went on, even countries like Mexico and Honduras were able to achieve increased compliance. And so in FY06, only um, two soft ripened and one um, semi-soft cheese were positive for listeria. And there's very little domestic product that's positive for listeria. So again, is this an imminent public health threat or not in cheese? Um, there was also in 2007 a joint FDA Health Canada public health risk assessment to actually look at the public health impact of listeria in soft ripened cheese. The assessment will include focus on sources of contamination, effects of individual manufacturing and or processing steps, and the effectiveness of intervention strategies, including new processing technologies. This risk assessment is now completed, but it hasn't been released. None of us have seen it. It was sent out for peer review, and um, I think they're responding to some of the comments of the peer review. Um, what's interesting, though, is that Health Canada, who initially was part of this joint risk assessment, two years ago at the American Cheese Society, we got some insight into directions that Health Canada is moving that may be counter to where the US is going. And where's Mansell? He can um, correct any of this that may be out of date. Health Canada has identified several elements that could be incorporated into an updated policy for soft and semi-soft cheeses made from unpasteurized milk. 
possible elements, some of which would require um, regulatory amendments, include no longer requiring a 60-day storage period for all soft and semi-soft cheeses made from unpasteurized milk, the establishment of microbiological criteria for milk used in the production of unpasteurized soft and semi-soft cheese, updating the existing microbiological criteria for cheese, requiring record keeping to support enforcement, developing an education campaign for consumers, and mandatory labeling requirements. I think these are spot on with the direction that we all should be going um, with respect to achieving cheese safety. And you can see the um, criteria for raw milk used in cheese making target staff. There is an upper limit of no more than 2,000 per mil of staph aureus. And then no detectable E. coli 0157H7 listeria or salmonella. And then in finished cheese products, um, again, tolerance limits for staff. Um, less than 10,000, um, an upper limit of 1,000 E. coli per gram, but no detectable 0157H7 listeria monocytogenes or salmonella. I don't know where this stands right now with respect to what Health Canada is doing, but again, I applaud them for really putting forward a model that um, addresses the real risks instead of um, perhaps what our FDA is doing. So, in, so there is hope, and I would hope that more governments approach this exercise like Canada is doing with um, taking into consideration the real risks. So in conclusion, I think the Food Safety Modernization Act will have a major impact on the artisan cheese industry worldwide. Cheesemakers need to understand the risks that they are required to manage, and that's why all the educational programs we can develop need to be done. Um, I think education and mitigation efforts are critical and being proactive is really the key. Thank you.